Amidst the strong men and murderers embroiled in the Prohibition gangster wars, only one mob boss constructed his crime empire based on the strength of his word and a simple handshake. Meyer Lansky's integrity held more value than the most intricately drafted contracts assembled by a team of lawyers. Known as the Casino King and the Quiet Godfather, Lansky epitomized humility and modesty. He dressed impeccably but avoided flashy attire, aiming not to draw unnecessary attention. A shrewd master manipulator, he claimed to have never killed a man himself. Instead, he conducted business through individuals accustomed to such acts, implicating him as equally guilty. Lansky turned his innate talent for numbers into a multi-million dollar gambling empire. His casinos hosted high rollers who both won and lost vast fortunes at the tables, with bets soaring to incredible sums as high as $100 bills. While immensely profitable and admittedly enjoyable for Lansky, his enterprise necessitated fleeing halfway around the world to evade the law. However, even that distance proved insufficient to fully escape the long arm of the law for Meyer Lansky. Lansky's birth is estimated around 1902, although his exact birth date remains unknown. His family resided in the Russian town of Grudna, a bustling center of trade on the Polish border that housed a thriving Jewish community. During his childhood, young Meyer immersed himself in Hebrew studies and frequented the synagogue with his beloved grandparents. However, life for Jews under the Russian rulers was harsh. Lansky witnessed the cruelty of the pogroms and the systematic persecution inflicted upon the Jewish population by the dreaded Cossack brigades. In a time of distress within the Jewish community, a young Jew proposed resistance instead of passive endurance. This notion resonated with Lansky, leaving a lasting impact on him, shaping his perspective on life. In March 1911, amid mounting hardships, Lansky's family decided to flee Russia for the United States. The transatlantic voyage was arduous, yet the determined nine-year-old Meyer, proud and resilient, refrained from displaying any seasickness, even if he eventually succumbed to it in private. Upon reaching America, the family settled initially in a quiet neighborhood in Brooklyn, later moving to a tenement on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. This area, teeming with over half a million inhabitants, primarily comprised Irish, Italians, and Jews, cramped into a densely populated two-square-mile cityscape. Despite excelling in academics, Lansky found a lure in the streets where the criminal world beckoned. Gambling became a particular draw for him. He often recounted an incident on the eve of the Jewish Sabbath when, entrusted with a pot of stew to be baked, he was sidetracked by a sidewalk crap game, resulting in the loss of the entrusted nickel and the absence of the stew the following day. This moment of youthful folly, Lansky would later express, brought not just shame but also a profound sense of anger at his own foolishness. Lansky made a solemn vow never to be taken advantage of again. He discovered his exceptional knack for numbers, effortlessly calculating odds and payoffs in games of chance. This talent led him to run clandestine gambling operations, raking in money and stashing it away. By the age of 16, Lansky had forsaken formal education. His tough reputation earned him the position of Arca Yish, an enforcer for older criminals, primarily involved in supporting local unions by intimidating strikebreakers. Despite his beginnings as a small-time hustler, Lansky aspired for greater heights. His path to success took shape when he encountered two pivotal partners in the ghetto, Ben Bugsy Siegel and Charlie Lucky Luciano. He won over Luciano's respect after fearlessly confronting him and his gang on the street, refusing to yield to their threats. The bond between Luciano and Lansky commenced from that confrontation. Lansky's acquaintance with Ben Siegel began when he helped the young hoodlum escape from police custody after a gang skirmish. Together, they formed the first street gang called the Bugs and Meyer Gang, with Siegel's muscle complementing Lansky's strategic intelligence. Siegel, nicknamed Bugsy due to his violent outbursts, embodied the gang's physical force while Lansky served as the brains behind their operations. Lansky cynically used Siegel's impulsiveness to accomplish their goals. With Siegel as his enforcer, Lansky orchestrated the gang's activities involving robberies, extortion, and consistently gambling. As Prohibition took effect in January 1920, Lansky, Siegel, and Luciano seamlessly transitioned into bootlegging, importing illegal whiskey from Canada and England into the United States, expanding their criminal enterprises. 
Lansky, still operating on a relatively small scale, sought guidance and mentorship. His pivotal encounter occurred at a bar mitzvah in 1921 when he crossed paths with Arnold the Brain Rothstein, a seasoned bootlegger and schemer revered as the sharpest gangster in New York. Rothstein offered financial support to young hoodlums like Lansky, allowing them to take risks on the streets while he backed their deals. Under Rothstein's tutelage, Lansky grasped the power of bribery over violence, expanding his modest chain of gambling establishments with minimal interference from law enforcement. However, in November 1928, Rothstein was murdered. While Lansky wasn't involved, Rothstein's demise provided an opportunity for Lansky and his associates to ascend in the criminal hierarchy. With Rothstein's demise, they eyed his empire and the significant role they had played within it, claiming it as their own. It wouldn't be long before Rothstein's protégés asserted dominance over gangland New York. However, among them, Lansky stood out as the inheritor of Rothstein's specialized mantle. He emerged as the next influential mind within the Mafia. As the Roaring Twenties drew to a close, Lansky and his mob associates firmly controlled the New York rackets. Lansky's forte lay in gambling, but to establish and run lucrative casinos, he required alliances with communities willing to turn a blind eye to illegal betting in return for a share of the profits. Saratoga Springs, in upstate New York, was one such town. Introduced to it by Rothstein in the late 1920s, Lansky found opportunities there. The town hosted a renowned racetrack where people from diverse economic backgrounds wagered during the day, while opulent nightclubs known as lake houses became hotspots for betting at night, an early iteration of the future Las Vegas casinos. Lansky operated gambling establishments within two renowned lake houses, the Piping Rock and the Arrowhead. It was here that he honed the persona he would maintain throughout his entire career, quiet, soft-spoken, and honest. Lansky firmly believed in conducting fair gambling operations, despising rigged setups like manipulated roulette tables or loaded dice, which were common in disreputable joints. Insisting on fairness, he established his reputation and amassed a modest fortune by his late twenties. By then, hundreds of thousands of dollars flowed through Lansky's hands. In the spring of 1929, Lansky chose to settle down. He married a beautiful young Jewish woman named Anne, who was a friend of Bugsy Siegel's girlfriend, Esther Krakow. Siegel served as a witness at Lansky's wedding. Initially content with domestic life, Lansky found solace in Anne's company while she enjoyed shopping along Fifth Avenue for their new home. However, the demands of Lansky's clandestine life, coupled with odd hours and an inability to confide in anyone, corroded his ability to maintain a meaningful personal relationship. The birth of their first child, Buddy, further strained their situation. Buddy suffered from cerebral palsy, which deeply affected Lansky. He felt a profound guilt, believing that his criminal pursuits brought punishment upon his family, blaming himself for his son's condition and harboring a subconscious guilt complex. Lansky, driven by a deep desire to cure his son's condition, delved into medical journals and rented an apartment in Boston for Buddy's treatment. This revealed a dichotomy in Lansky's life. He poured his love and positive feelings into seeking redemption for his son's life while simultaneously operating as one of New York City's most powerful criminals. Unlike other gang leaders, Lansky learned to navigate the underworld, avoiding vendettas and police attention through his personal method, fairness. In the criminal world, a handshake from Meyer Lansky held more weight than any meticulously crafted legal contract. His word was solid, making him distinct from his partners. While Siegel was a ladies' man and Luciano basked in his gangster reputation, Lansky led a quiet and meticulously ordered life. His personal habits mirrored his approach to business. Fedoras carefully placed on stands, shirts neatly hung on monogrammed hangers. Lansky was unassuming, shy, and retiring in demeanor, but when it came to business dealings, he could be as ruthless as his murderous associates. In 1931, Lansky assisted Lucky Luciano in taking over the New York mob. This involved eliminating rival bosses Salvatore Marzano and Joe the Boss Masseria. Luciano faced difficulties with Marzano, who trusted no one, especially young Italian climbers like himself. Lansky's Jewish gunmen were instrumental in the events that transpired at Marzano's office. They were dispatched by Meyer Lansky, claiming to be agents from the Treasury Department. They arrived at Marzano's office, stating they needed to inspect the books. As Marzano approached, Lansky was among the gunmen who shot and stabbed him. 
This act cemented Lucky Luciano's position as the dominant figure, with Lansky standing by his side. Excluded from the Italian Mafia due to his Jewish heritage, Lansky still wielded considerable power in New York. However, his triumph was short-lived as Prohibition ended in 1933, drying up the cash flow from bootlegging. A greater setback occurred in 1936 when Lucky Luciano was convicted of running prostitution rings and sentenced to 30 to 50 years in prison. With Luciano incarcerated, New York authorities speculated about six potential successors, including Lansky. Sensing trouble, Lansky wisely told his friend Ben Siegel that they should depart. Siegel headed to Hollywood, while Lansky set his sights on Florida to explore gambling opportunities. Lansky targeted Hallandale, a beach town near Miami, known for its leniency toward illegal betting. However, local gangsters already controlled these games, posing a challenge for Lansky to enter the scene. Recruiting new thugs became problematic, as the era of young Jewish gunmen was fading. Many were now pursuing education in law or medicine. Consequently, Lansky realized the necessity of having Italian partners in every enterprise he entered. Vincent Allo, famously known as Jimmy Blue, emerged as Meyer Lansky's key partner. In Hallandale, he orchestrated a takeover of the gambling scene despite resistance. Lansky established three casinos, appointing his brother Jake Lansky to oversee operations. Not hesitant to use money as a solution, Lansky assuaged conflicts with financial deals, relying on payoffs to maintain control. He even paid every family in the town a weekly allowance to tolerate the casinos and stay away from them. Joseph Vaughn, the Hallandale city attorney, was also a beneficiary of Lansky's generosity. Lansky's influence extended even further, as demonstrated when Vaughn received gambling chips whether he won or not during his visits to Detroit. In Florida, Lansky continued his tradition of offering high-quality entertainment and exquisite dining, attracting elite patrons. His reputation for fairness attracted high rollers from across the country, resulting in monumental cash flows. Lansky's casinos saw astonishing sums wagered, with individual players like Joe Milstein losing staggering amounts, adding to the house's considerable profits. Lansky and his associates were raking in millions from illicit casino profits under the protection of the New York Mafia. However, amid Lansky's flourishing enterprises in the tropics, a dark cloud loomed globally the ascent of Adolf Hitler in Germany. For Lansky, this resurgence of fascist oppression was a haunting reminder of his family's history with persecution. While visiting New York, he proactively sought out Nazi sympathizers, notably the German-American Bund, intervening with hired muscle to disrupt their rallies. His involvement in wartime efforts came when Navy intelligence sought the mob's help in keeping the New York docks free from Nazi sabotage. Recognizing the Sicilian Mafia's control over the waterfront and his incarcerated associate Lucky Luciano's sway over them, the Navy approached Lansky to bridge the gap. Pledging patriotism, Lansky brokered a series of crucial meetings between the Navy and Lucky in prison. The result? No sabotage and strengthened ties between Lansky and the Italian mob. Post-war, Lansky took his second son, Paul, on a trip to Las Vegas to monitor the activities of his uncle, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. Lansky felt the need to closely monitor Bugsy due to his penchant for a lavish lifestyle that sometimes clashed with business. Bugsy, using mafia funds, aimed to transform Las Vegas into a gambling paradise, beginning with the construction of the opulent Flamingo Hotel. However, mismanagement and excessive spending were jeopardizing the Flamingo's success before its launch. Bugsy was steering the project toward financial ruin. Shortly after Lansky's visit, Benny Siegel was fatally shot in Los Angeles, an act unlikely to occur without Lansky's awareness. Lansky, although he consistently denied giving the green light for Siegel's murder, acknowledged their closeness. I loved him, Lansky would later express, adding that as long as Siegel heeded his advice, he remained out of trouble. With Siegel's demise and Lucky Luciano's deportation to Italy after his release from prison, Lansky was the sole remaining member of their New York trio in America. His ascent as the foremost tycoon within the mob was just beginning. By the late 1940s, Lansky had solidified his gambling empire in Florida, reaping millions from tourists frequenting his lavish casinos near Miami. A substantial chunk of these earnings was channeled back to his partners in the New York Mafia, who provided the necessary muscle. However, amidst his flourishing business ventures, Lansky faced a challenge he couldn't manage, his family. 
His wife struggled to cope with his frequent absence as he shuttled between his Florida casinos and New York base. The strain led to their divorce in 1947, and she was later placed in a mental hospital. Lansky, post-divorce, attempted to become more involved in family matters, especially concerned about his disabled son, Buddy. He sought assistance from Vincent Mercurio, a hospital volunteer who had interacted with Buddy during his therapy sessions. Lansky became fond of Mercurio and often offered him advice. During outings, Lansky inquired if Mercurio gambled, warning him against starting. Because you're always going to lose, Lansky cautioned, his counsel rooted in a comprehensive understanding of the odds. Reluctantly, Lansky recommended only one casino game, Blackjack, acknowledging a 17.5% winning chance, dubbing other games as Sucker Games. However, in 1948, Lansky encountered a setback as American sentiment turned against gambling. Cities like Hallandale withdrew their support, resulting in the closure of Lansky's casinos. Yet he weathered the crisis with his stash of millions. During this period, his family life appeared to stabilize. His son Paul's acceptance into West Point brought immense pride to Lansky. In 1948, Lansky entered his second marriage with Teddy Schwartz, a manicurist he met in Florida. However, upon returning from his honeymoon in Europe, Lansky was greeted with unpleasant news. U.S. Senator Estes Kefauver had initiated an investigation into organized crime in New York. Lansky learned that Mercurio, staying with his son Buddy in New York, had accepted a subpoena meant for Lansky. Lansky instructed Mercurio to respond on his behalf, but Mercurio declined, leaving Lansky in a predicament. Lansky exercised his Fifth Amendment right when summoned for hearings related to organized crime, televised for the first time, exposing his prominent position in the criminal world. Facing a Florida indictment for illegal gambling, Lansky's personal lawyer advised him to fight. But Lansky contemplated pleading guilty to avoid testifying against fellow mob associates. He later faced another indictment in Saratoga Springs, pleading guilty again. However, this time a fine wouldn't suffice. Lansky spent three months in county jail and upon release in August 1953 decided to move his gambling operations overseas. He ventured to Cuba, where gambling was legal and welcomed by mobsters, aiming to internationalize his gambling empire. Cuba sought Lansky's expertise to salvage its tarnished casino industry, marred by scandal and cheating allegations. President Batista offered Lansky the role of gambling overseer, trusting his reputation for fair gaming. Lansky, with fervor, demanded other casino operators to clean up or leave. Under his management, Cuban tourism flourished and Lansky's involvement brought significant wealth as he invited his mafia associates to invest in the Cuban gambling scene. Lansky ensured he remained in President Batista's favor by consistently carrying a briefcase with at least $100,000 on his visits to Cuba. Their rapport was evident through Batista's warm reception and monetary gifts. Lansky established a third residence in Havana and managed his own casino, the National, adopting his familiar role, quietly overseeing operations while money poured in. Recognized by the patrons yet unspoken to, Lansky's status was unmistakable in the casino. He was attended to by the staff, particularly waiter Jorge Fernandez, and shielded by a team of bodyguards discreetly armed for protection. Cuba seemed like a secure base for Lansky, where he was cautious yet influential. In 1956, Lansky, known for advising against gambling, took a colossal risk, pooling his funds to invest in the renowned Hotel Riviera in Cuba. He reinvested in the hotel, which was considered the most comfortable in Cuba at the time, featuring the first central air conditioning system. Lansky gradually spent more time in Cuba, distancing himself from American investigators, seeking refuge from legal scrutiny. However, even the influential figure in organized crime couldn't evade the law indefinitely. In October 1957, New York mob boss Albert Anastasia was brutally murdered in a Manhattan barbershop. Authorities discovered that before his death, Anastasia was exploring investments in Cuban casinos. Consequently, they sought to question Meyer Lansky regarding Anastasia's intentions. As Lansky planned a brief visit to New York, the police seized the opportunity to arrest and interrogate him about Anastasia's murder. Lansky vehemently denied any involvement or knowledge of the incident. In an ironic turn, he was charged with vagrancy, a technicality that deeply offended the affluent Lansky. The police, suspicious of Lansky's activities, assigned Detective William Graff to tail him. 
Lansky approached Graf in the hotel lobby, expressing a problem that initially seemed like a confession but turned out to be about procuring quality chickens for his hotel in Cuba. This poultry shortage, however, didn't hinder the success of the Riviera Hotel, which was thriving under Lansky's management. Despite Lansky's legitimate success, unforeseen challenges arose. Fidel Castro's rebel forces, entrenched in the Cuban mountains, had been mounting attacks against Batista's regime for three years. By New Year's Eve 1958, just a year after the Riviera's inauguration, Castro's troops gained control over Cuba's main cities, leading to Batista's swift departure. After Fidel Castro's ascent to power and the expulsion of American gangsters from their casinos in Cuba, Meyer Lansky found himself at the lowest point of his career. The millions he'd invested in the Havana Riviera Hotel were gone, seized by force when Castro's troops took over Havana. The loss devastated Lansky leaving him with no choice but to seek alternative means of amassing his fortune. Meanwhile, amid these setbacks, Lansky's personal life had some moments of joy. He celebrated the arrival of his first grandchild, named Meyer II, after Lansky himself. However, his health was on the decline, aggravated by a serious heart attack in 1962. As if these challenges weren't enough, Lansky became a target in a clandestine FBI operation. Unsanctioned surveillance, including bugging the homes of prominent mobsters across the country, inadvertently captured Lansky's conversations. He was heard remarking to his wife that organized crime was bigger than you steal, a phrase that attracted the suspicion of federal agents. The FBI saw Lansky as the chief financial officer of a vast clandestine mob enterprise, a perception supported by intercepted conversations of a New Jersey mobster boasting about Lansky's involvement in Nevada gambling, particularly in skimming profits from Las Vegas casinos. Despite these suspicions and intercepted conversations, Lansky remained elusive from any arrests or formal charges. Since the bugs were unauthorized, the federal authorities couldn't employ the evidence they gathered against the mob tycoon. Consequently, the FBI had to observe Meyer Lansky continuing his daily routine in Miami Beach, strolling, having coffee in the afternoon, and frequenting clubs at night. Amid these mundane activities, one recurring sight for Lansky was Jewish comedian Jackie Mason, who frequently performed in Miami. Surprisingly, Lansky, the prominent figure in the Mafia, found himself followed around by Mason. Lansky assumed Mason's presence indicated a liking for his comedic act rather than an attempt on his life. After Mason's shows, he joined Lansky and his circle of friends at their table. Lansky observed Mason's enjoyment of the power he held, evident in the way people worshipfully surrounded him. Lansky often playfully probed Mason about his wealth, but he never gleaned any information. The FBI faced a similar predicament. Lansky proved an elusive target and their unauthorized surveillance yielded little. To tackle this, the FBI assembled a dedicated team of agents known as a strike force solely focused on nailing Lansky. Leading this team was a young prosecutor named R.J. Campbell. However, Lansky, despite his prominent underworld status, seemed almost retired, though his retired status was questionable as he wasn't actively engaging in any criminal activities. Nevertheless, his daily routine, particularly his walks with his dog, Bruiser, made him an easy subject for photographers. Despite his seemingly low profile, in March 1970, upon Lansky's return from a vacation in Mexico, Customs agents discovered a bottle of ulcer medicine in his luggage, lacking a prescription. This led to Lansky's arrest for possession of illegal drugs, but the charge was ultimately dismissed. However, the incident marked a turning point as Lansky grew weary of the scrutiny and pressure from law enforcement. He made the decision that the best course of action was to seek asylum where any Jew could find refuge, Israel. Lansky had always held a deep admiration for Israel. In 1948, during Israel's fight for independence, Lansky organized a fundraiser in support. He also claimed to have used his connections in New York to divert weapons from reaching the Arabs and send them to Israel. He believed that his loyalty to Israel would eventually be recognized and rewarded. In June 1970, Lansky and his wife Teddy flew to Tel Aviv. However, by 1971, the Justice Department summoned him back to the U.S. after 10 years of investigations. Finally, the feds indicted Lansky for skimming profits from Las Vegas casinos. Nonetheless, in Tel Aviv, Lansky seemed unfazed as he had anticipated this scenario. He had already planned to apply for Israeli citizenship. 
However, Lansky's notorious gangster reputation began catching up with him at the worst possible moment. The Israeli press began taking a keen interest in him as a relic of the Jewish mafia world. To evade the press coverage, Lansky moved from Tel Aviv to a resort hotel on the Mediterranean beach. Yet the cameras found him there too, much like they had in Miami while he was out walking his dog. In an attempt to mitigate the negative publicity, Lansky granted interviews to reporters claiming victimhood due to media sensationalism. The newspapers intensified their campaign against him, painting an image that escalated beyond control. Lansky lamented the exaggerations, including false claims about his wealth, highlighting that he wished he possessed even a fraction of the purported fortune. The escalating controversy compelled Israel's interior minister, Joseph Borg to reassess Lansky's citizenship application. Borg brought up the delicate issue of Lansky's reputation during this review process. One afternoon, Lansky found himself in a meeting with Prime Minister Golda Meir, who apparently had no prior knowledge of Mr. Lansky. As Lansky began explaining who he was or was perceived to be, the mention of mafia prompted Golda Meir to interject and exclaim vehemently, mafia, mafia, no mafia in Israel. Israel subsequently rejected Lansky's application for citizenship, deeming him a threat to the state. Lansky swiftly appealed this decision to the Israeli Supreme Court. The U.S., now eager to have Lansky back, willingly provided Israel with extensive files on Lansky's activities. These files contained first-hand testimonies from witnesses who had seen Lansky engage in violent activities dating back to the 1920s and 1930s. This contrasted starkly with Lansky's seemingly innocuous activities in the 1970s, such as walking his dog. In September 1972, Israel's Supreme Court ruled against Lansky, ordering him to leave the country immediately. Faced with expulsion, Lansky orchestrated a secretive escape plan, intending to bribe officials to help him flee to Paraguay. In November 1972, Lansky clandestinely boarded a night flight to South America, bound for Paraguay. However, as his plane crossed the Atlantic, the FBI managed to track him down. Upon his arrival in Paraguay, Lansky was prohibited from disembarking. At every stop the plane made, FBI agents stood on the tarmac alongside local authorities, ensuring Lansky remained on board. Eventually, the plane would return, leading Lansky inevitably back to Miami for arrest. The FBI eagerly anticipated this arrest, wanting to finally detain Lansky and build a case against him. The aging mob tycoon found himself confronting his own country in the courtroom, forced into a battle with the government. Meyer Lansky's attempted escape to Israel faced a major setback on November 7, 1972, when he was apprehended upon arrival in Miami. Lansky was arrested and charged with contempt of court and income tax evasion. His wife, Teddy Lansky, arrived in Miami from Tel Aviv three days later. Unlike her composed husband, Teddy, unaccustomed to dealing with reporters, resorted to a tactic he had never tried. She spat on them. The Justice Department celebrated Lansky's return to the U.S. He had been a prime target for the FBI for years, yet he had never been convicted of anything beyond illegal gambling. The authorities now aimed to secure a substantial conviction against him. Lansky's first trial was for contempt of court. He had failed to appear before a Miami grand jury while in Israel. Despite claiming medical reasons, the jury found him guilty, sentencing him to a year in prison, pending appeal. However, Lansky still had to face trial for tax evasion. The case primarily relied on an unreliable informant, Vincent Fat Vinnie Teresa, a Boston mobster. Teresa informed federal authorities that he had funneled illegally obtained casino profits from London to mob investors in the States and claimed to have personally handed Lansky thousands of dollars on two occasions. This testimony was pivotal as it was the first instance of someone testifying to placing significant amounts of money directly into Lansky's possession. The trial commenced in July 1973, with Teresa testifying that he had given Lansky mob money twice in Miami. Lansky's lawyer, David Rosen, countered this claim, proving that Lansky was in Boston during one of those occasions. Lansky himself, frail and limited to short trial sessions due to increasing frailty, never took the stand. The government saw Teresa as its best chance to nail Lansky, but the trial remained a challenge due to the nature of turncoat witnesses like Fat Vinny. Meyer Lansky appeared like anyone's grandfather, exuding a harmless demeanor that hardly resembled an organized crime figure. 
When questioned about his defense attorneys, he declined to comment. The jury acquitted Lansky of allegations involving money from Vinnie Teresa, and a separate indictment for skimming in Las Vegas was withdrawn. Due to his age and declining health, Lansky was deemed unfit to stand trial, leading to the overturning of his 1974 conviction for contempt of court. In the heavily Jewish enclave of Miami Beach, Lansky evolved into an elder statesman and a living legend. Among the devout Jews there, he held a status akin to a deity. Observers in Miami Beach were captivated by Lansky's every action, his pace while walking, his companions, or his routine activities. There was an incident in a local deli where two young boys, sporting yarmulkas, approached Lansky seeking his autograph. He responded with a touch of humor, feigning surprise at their request, jesting about an Academy Award and ultimately declining to sign, stating, No son, I don't sign autographs. Since the 1960s, Lansky professed retirement, which, as per the FBI's observations, appeared genuine. Despite extensive surveillance, he seemed incapable of re-engaging in skimming or other illicit ventures that once lined his pockets. Ironically, his longevity became a curse. He outlived his wealth, lacking avenues for further earnings. In 1982, turning 80, Lansky battled lung cancer. His attorney, Joe Varon, managed to restore his voting rights, lost since his 1950 felony conviction offering it as a birthday present. Lansky, appreciative, deemed it the best he'd ever received. However, on November 15, 1982, Lansky passed away. At his funeral, reporters swarmed, though it was rumored he left behind a vast fortune stashed away. Nonetheless, he outlasted most of his associates from the heyday of the New York mob. Lansky's strength lay in silence. Even when he spoke, he divulged nothing about himself or his partners. Throughout his career, he stayed steps ahead, especially when dealing with legitimate adversaries, relishing the advantage he held. Lansky projected a demeanor that appeared benign, but those close to him understood the implicit threat behind his steely gaze. Despite his claims of never having killed anyone, his power often rested in the intimidation he wielded, a tool he knew well and exploited to the very end. Ending thanks for watching this episode on the Mafia Biography Channel. We hope you found the insights into the life and legacy of Meyer Lansky intriguing and thought-provoking. Stay tuned for more gripping stories and engaging content. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more spine-chilling tales and historical accounts. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay curious, and keep surviving.